inaugural session of the Be Well Texas Harm Reduction Echo. My name is Shreya Prasanan. I'm super excited to facilitate today's session. Please note that we are recording these sessions for later distribution. Know that your names do not appear on the recording of this session, nor does anything listed on chat. A few quick announcements before we begin. Uh, to help us with attendance, please enter your name, affiliation, and email into the chat function. To access the chat feature, click on the speech bubble icon on the navigation bar at the bottom of your window. If you've joined by phone only, note that we may call you after the session to confirm your attendance. We appreciate your support in helping us fully capture this record. Some housekeeping, please stay muted unless you're speaking. If you've joined by computer, your mute button is on the bottom left of your Zoom controls. If you're on the phone, just press star six. We encourage everyone to join by video, especially for the discussion portion of our session. That said, we're just happy you're here regardless of how you connect. We also encourage you to unmute and speak, or if you prefer, you can use the chat feature to share comments and questions. Please note that no protected health information is allowed in either the chat or our discussion. Towards the end of the session, the BeWell Texas team will send out a link to an evaluation survey. All participants filling out the survey will be automatically entered into a raffle for a $1.30 Walmart gift card. So please go ahead and participate. Our didactic today is on a very pertinent topic, drug user health in the South, harm reduction for Texas. Following that, we will discuss a case presented by Dr. Alicia Kowalchuk. We will start with introductions, followed by didactics, announcements, case presentation, and open discussion. Thank you again for joining us at today's ECHO. In the spirit of all teach, all learn, we encourage you all to share your experiences, questions, and insight in today's conversation. With that, we'll do some introductions. Uh, Chris? Hey, everybody. Uh, Christopher Abert with Southwest Recovery Alliance. Uh, we do syringe service programs, um, some medications for opioid use disorder, uh, advocacy, as well as naloxone distribution, uh, drug testing, and other services. In, in a nutshell, we want to just create a space where people who use drugs can come and experience being treated with respect and dignity uh, and being met exactly where they are. Thank you so much. Aaron? Hi, I'm Aaron Ferguson. Um, I kind of wear three hats. I'm an outreach manager with a national opioid treatment provider called Community Medical Services. Um, and I'm on the leadership team of the Urban Survivors Union, which is a group of nationally uh, directly impacted advocates for drug user health. And, um, and I produce a podcast called Narcotica about drugs to people who use them. Um, I'm a person who owes my life to harm reduction and wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the people who met me where I was at. And um, so I want to be able to give that back and contribute to the conversation here and put our heads together about how we can increase access to harm reduction services in Texas and ultimately um, stem the rising tide of overdose deaths uh, that's taking place both here in Texas and across the country uh, with the tools that science has given us. So I appreciate everyone's attendance here and I look forward to our work together. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, Claire? Hi, everyone. I'm Claire Zagorski, and I'm at the University of Texas at Austin College of Pharmacy in the FARM program. And I am a harm reductionist as well as a paramedic, and I've been doing this for about 10 years. It's going to be it's about nine and a half right now. Like Aaron, I am all, also a podcaster. I have a podcast called Drug Futurisms. We talk about potential futures for drugs. And I'm uh, very excited that you're all here and that we can discuss kind of a clinical uh, merging or clinical application for harm reduction practice. One of the very first things that hit me when I started doing work here on the streets in Austin was that it was incredibly impactful, incredibly smart, and that there was very little recognition of any of the work being done in the clinical space and that there was a giant disconnect. So I'm very excited to see all of you here to help build that bridge and figure out you know, best ways to really 
amp up the impact for Texans who use drugs and beyond Texas. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Um, Alicia Kowalczyk. Hi, I'm Alicia, Dr. Kowalczyk. I'm an associate professor here at Baylor College of Medicine and medical director of um, Santa Maria Hostel uh, here in town, as well as the Houston uh, so Sobering Center uh, and our um, County Safety Net Hospitals Expert Program, um, and happy to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Andrea Hebler. Um, my name is Andrea Hebler, and I'm a project coordinator for ECHO here at UT Health San Antonio. Happy to be here. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Adrian Lindsay. Hi, I'm Adrian Lindsay. I'm the director of the Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring, or CSTAT, here at Be Well Texas, which includes all of our ECHO programming. Um, so just wanted to yeah. say, really excited to see all of you here. I want to mention one other person that we can't introduce because she won't be joining us until June, but we do have one more subject matter expert that will be joining us, uh, Monique Tula. She is the former uh, executive director of the National Harm Reduction Coalition, and she just brings a wealth of experience. So we're excited for, us, uh, for her to join us as well, but she's starting to enjoy her retirement a bit first. Um, and if you don't mind, Trey, I'll just say a little bit about ECHO for those of you that are new to ECHO. Um, and I do recognize some familiar faces. So I know many of you are in our other ECHO programs, um, but just so you're aware, this is a, a online learning community. So we hope everyone will come back and join us regularly and we get to know each other better and do some networking and, and things like that. Um, as far as format, each session, we'll, we'll have about a 15 to 20 minute didactic. We'll cover a harm reduction related topic. And then the second half of the session will be uh, spent on a case. So one of, one of the learners, one of yourselves will bring a case, uh, just quickly informally present on that, and then you will get recommendations and feedback and probably lots of questions from our hub of experts and the other learners. So if you're up for presenting a case in the future, please uh, let us know in the chat, but that's, that's kind of how things will go from here each month. So thanks, Shreya. Thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay, for that introduction. Uh, we just want, I want to just say that we're excited to be here, and this is an amazing space, and we cannot wait to see what we can learn today. So with that, we'll move on to our didactics. Um, Chris, whenever you're ready. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? And you can see my slides? Yes. Well, that's a miracle, good. <laughs> Off to a great start. So yeah, we're gonna talk um, about drug user health in the South and harm reduction. Um, I also, full disclosure, and besides this disclosure, I've got 15 to 20 minutes to talk about something that we could do PhDs on. Um, so I'm gonna to try to condense it down and hit some highlights. Uh, but if you have favorite topics in harm reduction, uh, they might not even be talked about uh, during this presentation. And that's what I'm excited about about this ECHO is that we have all of this time to get to know each other and to continue uh, to learn uh, over a, hopefully a long, long period of time and really spread the, uh, the good news about harm reduction. So yeah, the disclosure is all speakers and all members of the planning, planning committee have no relevant financial relationship or commercial interest to disclose. I'll read that in case anybody's on the phone. Uh, again, I'm the founder of the Southwest Recovery Alliance. I've been working in harm reduction for a long time. I've been doing social service provision with domestic violence, people who use drugs for over 20 years, um, and primarily focusing around hepatitis C. I'm a survivor of hepatitis C, survivor of overdoses, uh, and a lot of personal experience with that. I came into this um, through a person named Dan Big up in Chicago. And he taught me everything I know, which was basically ask people what they need and then try to provide those services. It was really that simple. Uh, in this uh, didactic, we're gonna try to come up with a definition of harm reduction. Uh, we're gonna identify the need for and the benefits of harm reduction. And we're gonna explain the continuum of social acceptability for various harm reduction practices. Uh, so sometimes it looks like harm reduction is a bipartisan issue. We're going to talk about um, A, that it's not, and B, that some of the ways we can uh, talk about it, regardless of who we are having a conversation with. 
Oh, let me see if I can get rid of that. Great. Okay, there are some acronyms. Uh, some of these are in my presentation and some of them will be in the case presentation later. I'll go through them very quickly. PUID, people who use drugs. Uh, I'm sorry, that should be PWUD. Uh, and then PUID is people who inject drugs, SSPs, our syringe service programs. We call them service programs rather than exchanges. Uh, when we do uh, didactic on that, we'll be happy to tell you why we've changed that language. Uh, substance use disorder, uh, which is a definable um, disorder in the DSM. We'll talk about that a little bit. HCV is the hepatitis C virus. Mood, medications for opioid use disorder. Uh, we used to call that MAT not too long ago. So uh, OEND, Overdose Education, Naloxone Distribution, IOP, which is Intensive Outpatient, CPS, Child Protective Services, and DV, Domestic Violence. So what is harm reduction? Does anybody want to throw up any... Um, actually, you can even unmute and just throw a couple things out if you want. When I say, what is harm reduction, any answers come immediately to people? Or share in the chat. Yes, Daniel Hatcher, you win 100%. Any positive change. We can end the didactic. <laughs> Preventing overdose is another, correct? Hi, um, can I chime in? Please. Awesome. My name is Stephanie. I'm with Parkland Health and Hospital System. Um, for me, when I think of harm reduction, I think about, you know, understanding that substance use will always continue. So versus instead of focusing on the substance use and the whole just stop using thing, we focus on ways how to reduce harm for those who are still uh, using substances. Yeah, that's a great point. So we know historically that if we look back in the record, up to 12,000 years ago, there's evidence of human beings um, taking intoxicants. Um, so I don't know of a society that hasn't partaken in drug use. Uh, and we will most likely, it's just a very pragmatic look at it, right? That we will very likely always have uh, problematic substance use uh, and that we can try to reduce the harm to it. So th there are a lot of different answers to this. If you look back here, maybe I can say, click back super quick. I picked this picture of myself with my bike helmet on on purpose, right? Not because I'm an avid biker, I'm not actually, I just like to bike to get around sometimes, but because I'm wearing a helmet and that's harm reduction. And I think we forget sometimes we engage in harm reduction all the time. I sometimes will ask people, have you ever been to a safe consumption facility uh, and nobody will raise their hand or maybe someone who's visited Denmark or now New York City will raise their hand. <clears throat> and when I explain that a bar is a safe consumption site, um, then everyone raises their hand, right? Designated drivers uh, are harm reduction. Um, pads, padding for sports, seatbelts, all those things are harm reduction. So we're engaging in harm reduction every day. And we're gonna focus today though on harm reduction in relation to uh, substance use. So if we're, if we're focusing on that substance use, uh, we can be very technical and we can say that it is a set of practical strategies to reduce negative consequences associated with drug use and risk behaviors. Uh, sometimes people will say, well, maybe we don't wanna reduce those negative consequences. You know, Maybe people should uh, have to experience those, uh, otherwise they won't be inclined to stop using. And the negative consequences we're talking about are very serious negative consequences, right? We're talking about dying. We're talking about um, HIV, hepatitis C, endocarditis, uh, the absolute life change. We're talking about permanent cri criminal records for people. Um, so these are, these are not light matters. Um, and I suppose if we should just allow people to die for using drugs, if that is the, that is oftentimes held up as an option. Um, for me, that's, that's just not an option, both because I'm personally um, affected and also because, <laughs> because I'm a human being, right? Uh, and I think sometimes we get so caught up on abstinence and thinking everyone needs to remain abstinence and you can't use these drugs that um, then we don't understand what we're saying. So enabling, enabling, suggests that if we take away the enabling help, right? So if we take away syringe exchanges or naloxone, that somehow the behavior will stop. And we know for a fact, without question, that the behavior will not stop. People will just use not sterile syringes. They will continue to use 
uh, and they will have fatal overdoses. Um, so that just a, a quick jump into enabling. So in, in, in relation to drug use, it incorporates a spectrum of strategies. Sometimes people think harm reduction is uh, the antithesis of abstinence. It is not. Abstinence is, is definitely within the continuum of harm reduction. So is safer use, managed use. Uh, as I said in the beginning, we meet people where they're at, uh, but we don't leave them there. So we meet them where they're at and we put out a buffet of options. I'll show a picture of that buffet soon. Uh, and my favorite is, and someone said this, uh, is positive change, any positive change, uh, the fertile ground of positive change between the extremes of chaotic drug use and abstinence. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. It's a, so this is 30 years of peer reviewed research that shows the efficacy of harm reduction. This is everything from naloxone distribution to, um, certain service programs and, and other programs. And the reason I put it up there is because there's a preponderance of evidence uh, that shows that this is effective. Um, so if you are interested in empirical data to back up what we're doing, uh, it is here. And, and I'll tell you, if we, as we go through this, uh, someone can show uh, peer reviewed research that shows that this is not effective, I would, I would be, I would consider uh, stepping away from whatever practice that was. This isn't, yeah. Uh, there are some basic principles of harm reduction. Uh, you might ask, well, who made these up? Well, people who were doing the work. Uh, so not too long ago, uh, there weren't any legal syringe service programs. There wasn't any uh, community naloxone distribution happening. And folks who were using drugs started doing that work themselves. Uh, so it started out in the late 80s and into the early 90s. Um, and as those folks started doing that work across the country, they started meeting once a year. And those meetings morphed into the National Harm Reduction Coalition Conference, which has happened in Puerto Rico this year. Uh, and during one of those, they sat down and they hammered out what are the principles that define what we're doing as harm reductionists. And the reason I want to bring this up is because oftentimes people might say that they're doing harm reduction, but not be following these principles. So it's a good thing to, to keep an eye out for. Uh, the first is that we center health and dignity of the, of the people that we're trying to help. And we center those as the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, that our services are participant centered, right? That we're involving participants in those services that we're asking again, uh, like what I learned, what do you need and how can I provide that to you? Uh, that we involve participants in those questions uh, and at every level of the organization uh, from peer outreach worker to peer executive director, right? Peer is just a vantage point. Uh, and we want to make sure that we have that vantage point represented throughout the entire organization. The CDC uh, just put out uh, recommendations for syringe service programs and participant involvement was a huge part of it. In fact, it was the very first part and it was centered. Um, recognizing the autonomy of our participants uh, as if any social workers or, uh, are on the line, we know that autonomy is one of the first things mentioned in the code of ethics. Uh, recognizing sociocultural factors that also influence people's ability to uh, you know, use certain drugs or access treatment or access housing, um, different social cultural factors will make different situations for different people using drugs. It is very complicated. And the last is pragmatism and realism. And that was kind of mentioned uh, earlier. there will always be illicit substance use. Um, and so be, be pragmatic about that and address it as a public health issue. Uh, but also the fact that there are real and tragic consequences to substance use. You know, we know that from alcohol, alcohol, which is totally legal, uh, has those. And, and that also can happen. What we know, though, is that typically severe substance use, chaotic drug use, what you want to, whatever you want to call it, doesn't happen in a vacuum. It almost always has concurrent illnesses and conditions. There's a great book by Carl Hart about that called Grown Up, uh, Drug Use for Grownups. Move in. Um, these are the current responses to substance use disorder. Prevention, treatment, and punishment. Uh, what harm reductionness, I believe universally would say, prevention is great. We should prevent people, particularly youth, uh, from engaging in substance use. Um, 
and prevent those people with those concurrent illnesses and conditions, right? Uh, and offer a lot of treatment. Uh, but I think we would pretty universally agree that punishment doesn't work. And there's like there's a good reason for that. So this is the criteria in the DSM for a diagnosis of, we'll say severe substance use disorder. That's most of the people that I come into contact with would have the, meet the criteria for severe substance use disorder. So if we look through these, and, and you don't have to, they're readily available, but I'm just going to blast through them really quick. And then I have the summary slide. And the summary slide is that criteria one, two, and four show that these, these folks are you seemingly using against their will and without their permission. Uh, they're, they're continuing to use despite negative consequences, right? And whether that is, uh, again, we don't have any evidence that it's the drug itself that does that. It is usually these concurrent illnesses and conditions. Uh, so we know high ACE scores can contribute to that. We know trauma both in childhood and in adulthood. Uh, we know that untreated mental illness. We know that uh, social factors, uh, racism and homelessness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, can contribute negatively to people's experience using these drugs. But the point is uh, that punishment isn't going to, if, if, if a majority of the criteria show that they will continue to use despite negative consequences, then punishment is not an effective tool, right? And we know that, but this just kind of lays it out for us. Uh, if it was an effective tool, then the 50 years of the war on drugs that we've been engaged in would have made a dent. And instead, we're in the middle of the worst crisis of illicit substances uh, in history. I think another reason that we should talk about the need for harm reduction um, comes from this. Uh, these, there's a few research papers here. One of them showed that 80% of the people who would have received a diagnosis of opioid use disorder, right, who were eligible for that diagnosis, were not in treatment. So again, if we just focus on um, prevention of drug use and treatment, then we're missing 80% of the population that actually uh, could use assistance and collaboration, right? So sometimes I would draw a diagram of, of, you know, people who are already using, obviously have passed the point of prevention and they're not to the point of treatment and they're, they're like down in this, in this canyon, 80% of them, we can go down there with harm reduction and assist them to make sure that they don't have lifelong consequences or life ending consequences. Uh, so 10% of those who needed substance use treatment received treatment at a special facility in the year of, I think it was 2017 for this study. So only 10% of the people who needed it received treatment. Uh, so we do need to ramp up treatment options. But here's the last part, and I thought this was stunning. 95% of people who were classified as needing but not receiving treatment didn't perceive a need for that treatment, right? So we know in motivational interviewing that, that you, have, you need to be internally motivated uh, to, to start to make those changes. Uh, and so people don't even have a perception of need for that treatment. So treatment would not be helpful for them. MI might be helpful, right? And going through and looking at ambivalence and asking a lot of questions and allowing them to um, identify for themselves the need for change. And when we're, when we're talking about harm reduction, when we're talking about abstinence only programs, uh, we're talking about basically one, uh, one success metric and that is abstinence, right? So clean urinalysis, that is the goal. You wanna get your kids back? we need clean UAs. You wanna get off probation, we need clean UAs. You wanna stay on methadone, we need clean UAs. And what harm reduction is saying is like, rather than basing it on these slight fluctuations in drug use, on, on, on people's, you know, whatever drugs are contained in people's bodies, maybe we should measure our success on the reduction of harm, such as HIV, such as incarceration, such as loss of social connection, transmissions of diseases, um, so it is, a, it is a paradigm shift away from just looking at abstinence as the goal uh, and being drug-free as the goal to looking at the improvement of quality of life. And we mean this at the individual and the community level. I want you to imagine that I have a thousand people coming in and each of them are making one small positive change in their life that's going to lead to the decrease in death and, and crime and, um, and disease, right? If I can get 1,000 people to make one small change, that cumulatively is going to add up to positive public health changes, 
Uh, people who use drugs don't live in a vacuum. We are part of the public. And so drug user health is public health. So anyway, that's just one example again of how these small positive changes can actually um, lead to, to major changes at, at, a, at a public level and huge cost savings, right? And we'll talk about that hopefully at some point about the Indiana HIV outbreak, that quarter billion dollars uh, that that ended up costing for one of the poorest, most rural counties in that state, Scott County, uh, and that's still being paid off. There was a town, Austin, Indiana, 4,000 people in that town. Of that 4,000, 231 people uh, had contracted HIV as, as a result of the lack of accessibility of sterile syringes. Uh, and that was what prompted then Governor Mike Pence uh, to allow syringe service programs. Uh, and his, uh, at the time, head of the Indiana Department of Health, Jerome Adams, who later became the Surgeon General, uh, to become a huge advocate uh, for syringe service programs and harm reduction in general. So we know, again, all that research that I showed, that, sh that, that slide with all the tiny writing, uh, that syringe access is the most effective evidence-based HIV prevention tool for people who inject drugs. Uh, we know that because people who were using drugs went out and started giving each other sterile syringes. Then the public health data came in and showed that it was effective and it did not increase drug use. Uh, we know that federal agencies like CDC, SAMHSA, HRSA, NIDA, they all conclude uh, that the use of sterile syringes to prevent the spread of HIV is effective. And again, we know that it was people who injected drugs, it was people who were using drugs uh, that led the way on these programs. Out in the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, there was a, almost like a side project of, of, um, of injection drug users, right? Uh, out of the ACT UP um, movement uh, that were just going out and taking care of each other. Uh, we also know that participants of SSP, syringe service programs are referred to other programs uh, that it helps people who don't have hepatitis C remain hep C free. And here's a big one, 80% reduction in HIV and hepatitis C. So if you have in your town, a syringe service program and easy access to buprenorphine or methadone, you will have an 80% reduction in HIV and hepatitis C transmission. And to remember each transmission of HIV uh, can end up costing about a half a million dollars for each person over a lifetime. Uh, and up until recently, hepatitis C transmissions were about $90,000. So it's getting down to about $30,000 now to, to cure. So we want to make these opportunities for people to make small changes. I'm going to blast you this. Sometimes there's misperceptions about harm reduction that we're out there, you know, celebrating drug use, that we're out um, enabling drug users, that we're condoning and endorsing and encouraging drug use, right? There that somehow there's a, there is a, discord between abstinence uh, and harm reduction. The only, the only discord between abstinence and harm reduction, honestly, usually comes on the side of the abstinence-based people, because if abstinence is your only option, then moderation and, and helping people to survive continued drug use is just not an option. Um, so it doesn't mean, harm reduction doesn't mean anything goes by any stretch of the imagination. What it does mean is that we do get to celebrate these small positive changes. For anyone that's worked with people who are using drugs or people who, who just have overwhelming amounts of problems, it's so relieving to be able to find one small thing that they can make progress in and celebrate it. And people can get a foothold from that one small change and possibly make another change rather than again, jumping the gorge, right? jumping immediately to something that might be at that point in the person's life impossible. Uh, we treat patients as individuals. We value their unique experiences and needs, right? There's no cookie cutter solution. There's no cookie cutter substance use disorder diagnosis, and there's no cookie cutter uh, uh, experience and needs for those people. So we need to listen to people. Uh, we need to see that people are more than their drug use, why we use person first language. Uh, the drug use is just the behavior. The behavior is unchangeable. The person uh, is valuable in and of themselves outside of those behaviors. Um, recognize the vulnerability when they're being honest with us and celebrate that when people are honest with us, uh, how vulnerable that is. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, hopefully we'll go over this sometime, motivational interviewing and trans theoretical theories of change. We know this is the, one of the most researched um, behavioral change uh, methods ever. I think it's like $150 million, 130,000 uh, research participants. Uh, again, the change has to be internally motivated. That's the 
very bad reduction of MI, <laughs> uh, but we can help people uh, navigate to that. How does this work in Texas? Well, uh, it already does work in Texas, right? And hopefully over the next year, we're going to start identifying people who are doing this work and getting them in contact with each other and building those networks. We're gonna start talking about work that's already happening, uh, obviously in Austin and other places. Uh, we're gonna expand probably what people think harm reduction is. Um, and then we're also going to talk about uh, how to talk with more conservative minded folks uh, about harm reduction. The good thing is that harm reduction is uh, widely supported uh, by some very prominent conservative uh, think tanks and publications. So, for example, Cato uh, is, a, is a, a wild uh, proponent of harm reduction and the end of the war on drugs, the Cato Institute. Uh, but so is Open Societies Foundation, which is run by George Soros. So it's, it's often, it's odd that we have these two th seemingly diametrically opposed think tanks uh, working together on this issue. Now, the National Review has published multiple articles about the war on drugs and about the effectiveness of uh, harm reduction. Reagan, Bush, and Trump Surgeon Generals all um, all looked at harm reduction and said, yes, uh, this is effective and we need to expand this. And again, as I mentioned, uh, Mike Pence and Scott County. And once Mike Pence had uh, allowed for harm reduction in a state like Indiana, uh, the, the dominoes just started falling across the country. So I don't have the map today, um, but more and more and more states, uh, you know, recently Oklahoma, Arizona, all enacted syringe service program laws to allow that overdose prevention and disease prevention. And here's my last slide, my last call out. I know we have a lot of social service providers on, on the line. Oftentimes when we're working with people, we're like, you have to remain abstinent. You have to remain abstinent. So we got to get you through this program. You have to remain abstinent, stop using drugs. So what if instead of only having that as our option, we also said you could have a sober sitter you could do therapy while you're continuing to use. Here's some naloxone. Here's how you could at least reduce use. Here's how you could stop use with your problematic drug, but continue use with other drugs that might be helping you with anxiety or other, uh, other issues. Here is housing for you. Here are, you know, here's a, here's a change in your mindset. HAMS is a, a alcohol harm reduction project. So again, hopefully throughout the year, we'll go through all of these, tell you what they are, uh, and start to expand out so that when we have people come in, it's not just, you've got to stop using drugs. People hear that everywhere they go, everywhere they go, they hear, you have got to stop using drugs. And if that was effective and threatening people was effective, we would have stopped this, uh, this scourge of overdose and disease uh, years and years ago. Uh, so here, here's an opportunity to open up all of these literally thousands of opportunities for positive change within the fertile ground of, of harm reduction. Lastly, I just want to say thank you for attending. Uh, it's an amazing uh, amount of people that we had registered for this event. We're super excited about it for Texas. Uh, and, and, and let's just kick up a love notch, right? So when we see someone that comes into our office that needs help, remember uh, they're survivors. Uh, they're very likely survivors of, of trauma. Uh, the fact that they even made it into the office to ask for help, given the a plethora of stigma and barriers against them. Um, but mostly that's what we can do. We can meet people where they are and we can treat them with respect and dignity. And if you wanna build rapport with people, if you're able to do that with a person who's actively using drugs and not judge them for their continued use and not judge them uh, for what maybe you wouldn't want for them, but what you understand why uh, they're engaged in that behavior, it's, it's the start of a, of a stunning reversal of relationships. Uh, and it's a really beautiful thing. I think that's what all the hub is here to do, uh, to try to share with everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. This is, uh, was an excellent presentation. Um, I believe there was a comment. Um, yeah, Chris, I was just gonna see if you could, I know we don't have much time for discussion so we can get to the case, but there was a comment in the chat just about around talking about clean UAs. I know you were using that term kind of sardonically, but do you want to say a bit about that and like patient-centered language that we might promote? And... Sure, we can have a, a reactive or a non-reactive. Uh, so yeah, oftentimes, 
Here's where it gets tricky too. So in that case, clearly saying reactive or non-reactive is the preferred. Uh, there are other times when people will be engaged in say Narcotics Anonymous where the common nomenclature is clean, right? And I'm even, even myself as a, as a person who has a long history of drug use, I'm not going to intervene with them and tell them like to, to refer to themselves in a different way, right? I might say something like, I never thought you were dirty. Uh, so, so that's why we would prefer reactive or non-reactive. Uh, even with the testing, like HIV testing, saying positive or negative can sometimes be very confusing, uh, right? When I say it's negative, is it like the news is negative or the test was negative? Um, so we, yeah, we want to be very clear and uh, for sure reactive or non-reactive uh, UAs. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move on to our announcements. Echo IT, could you please share those? Thank you so much. Uh, Be Well Texas is a welcoming environment with caring professionals who are ready to help people start or continue their journey towards recovery. Be Well Texas is committed to expanding equitable access to compassionate, evidence-based treatment and care for SUD throughout Texas. We have lots of exciting stuff happening here at Be Well Texas. Please join us on Thursday, May 26th for the first session of our Systems and Sustainability ECHO program. We will tackle system level challenges and barriers encountered when providing substance use disorder treatment in different healthcare and behavioral health settings. Other new programs lined up. Uh, we have one for public safety professionals and the other for behavioral health workforce. These are coming soon. So keep, uh, look out for our emails. Next slide, please. Remember, we will continue offering our Text RX, RSS, and Shout Echo series. With the new one time registration link, it is very easy to have all our echoes on your calendar. You can register for any of our echo programs at bewelltexas.org. Next slide. The Bewell Texas Clinic offers low cost, self pay, and no cost services for patients affected by substance use disorder. We have insurance options available as well. Next slide. And our next harm reduction echo is on Thursday, June 2nd, where we will discuss outreach strategies for harm reduction. If you haven't already, please be sure to download the calendar invitation in your registration confirmation email for all future sessions. Thank you. And now we'll move on uh, to the case presentation. Um, once Echo IT shares uh, the case on the screen, Dr. Cobble, should you can take it away. Thank you. So thank you for that excellent uh, preceding presentation. Um, when I was asked to uh, present a case, uh, what came to mind for me in regard to harm reduction and kind of uh, just personally where I feel uh, sometimes I have some challenges uh, around this work is treatment contracts in the mood setting, which is kind of standard of care for us to have people sign these treatment contracts. And then, you know, uh, we're supposed to hold them accountable um, and challenges with that, right? Feeling like, okay, um, I want to meet someone where they're at. Um, and then I have this contract thing. Uh, knowing that the data uh, or the you know research literature around contracts has never shown that they do much of anything, right? But it's still one of those things as a prescriber that we're supposed to have checked off. Um, also, looking again at uh, the treatment contract that we're using, um, which was just one kind of downloaded, modified a little bit with our um, organization's name and things like that. Um, but didn't look too closely when we first started using it. Um, it was, you know, through one of the PCSS links, so reputable. Um, but then I kept noticing the one thing when I review it with, with patients, 
um, please don't show up to your appointments intoxicated or under the influence. And I'm thinking that's when I want my patient definitely not to miss their appointment when they may be struggling with a slip or relapse. And so I thought maybe talking about that um, as a group might be helpful or useful for someone besides me too. Um, and then the other uh, piece of this uh, case is really um, about moving forward with consistent um, OEND for all uh, patients uh, with uh, any type of opiate uh, that's getting prescribed. And this is in several of the systems that I work in, both at Santa Maria, we routinely do OEND uh, with all our clients slash patients. Um, particularly with opiate use disorder, uh, but even those without now that fentanyl is so contaminating and other synthetics, the drug supply uh, in our area, which I know we're not unique here in Houston. Um, but also um, one of my other hats is at Harris Health, which is our county safety net system. And so um, I'm part of their opiate test force. And we've recently um, put right in our EHR anytime someone is, you know, getting, um, you know, standing opiate scripts um, meets uh, certain criteria, like there's a diagnosis of, of a use disorder uh, or a, a history of overdose noted in the EHR, it prompts the provider to, um, with just one click, uh, saying yes. It actually takes more clicks to say no to co-prescribe naloxone, which is great. Um, but in both settings, I've had some pushback from um, patients, clients, on receiving the naloxone and wanting to accept it. And so thinking about um, how to talk to uh, folks, um, you know, around that um, and, and what's okay to say, okay, we're meeting this person where they're at and, and when should we nudge a little harder? Is that appropriate? When is that appropriate? And kind of what are the strategies um, other folks use um, to help, you know, make sure people have something that they may um, not think that they need right now, but may need because um, a child in the home accidentally gets into the wrong thing or um, an elderly family member um, misreads something and, and gets the wrong thing. So um, those were the two things that I really kind of wanted to engender conversation around with this case. And I hope that's helpful for folks. Um, so um, the, uh, client will be discussing um, is a person um, who uh, began missing their mood follow-up appointments with us. Um, she had uh, come in uh, for opiate use disorder, uh, also uh, had a history of uh, benzodiazepine use uh, slash use disorder, uh, more mild to moderate with with the benzodiazepines, um, definitely taking them not as prescribed at times, um, but uh, um, full loss of control uh, and severe consequences from the benzodiazepines uh, we weren't seeing yet, um, and definitely significant opiate use disorder, uh, CPS involvement. Um, and uh, this person uh, completed, um, medically managed withdrawal of uh, their benzodiazepines, uh, mood initiation, uh, and residential, a full 90 days in residential, and um, at the time was engaged with our IOP program, um, but also um, was living still on our residential campus uh, because we have some HUD housing available for those folks that um, need that to make transition. Um, had a lot of uh, strengths, um, uh, she had a place that was sober and supportive to stay at the moment. Uh, she was well engaged with the IOP program, uh, was um, her uh, counseling and recovery coach staff increasing her involvement with the recovery community, um, the high school diploma and some college. So had some, um, you know, uh, um, things going for her as she was starting to um, uh, get out on the job market uh, to start looking for things. Um, so we can go down. Um, and um, you can see that um, she, uh, her significant mental health 
symptoms at the time were mostly anxiety. She had a history of depression, um, but that was really um, kind of very stable, um, still a little anxiety um, going down. Um, had some trauma history, uh, again, um, for our facility, um, you know, she had a, an ACE score of three, so some trauma. Um, her most recently, her um, most recent partner uh, was abusive and, and she had uh, was making a break from that, which is why she needed the HUD housing services as well. Um, and you can see that um, she was taking Suboxone, um, eight milligrams twice a day, um, Duloxetine, 30 twice a day, um, Hydroxazine, 25 QID and 50 at bedtime and some Fusferone. She does have a history of chronic pain. She started her opiate use disorder with an MBA in um, high school, was not substance related. She was a passenger. Um, and she had uh, recently um, given birth to her son uh, before coming into us in residential. That's how CPS became involved. Um, and so she was HIV and Hep C tested and negative. And so um, I could talk a little bit about what was going on with her um, appointments. So initially she was coming quite regularly. And then we had. Um, several um, appointments where um, she lives right on campus, literally involves a walk across the quad um, to see us, um, where they are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday in terms of the mood prescribers that are on campus. And so, um, you know, our nursing staff would uh, let her know uh, a day or two ahead of time, hey, don't forget your appointment's coming up. We always give the next appointment uh, with our patients uh, before they leave. Um, and we do the standard, we write from uh, scripts to cover until the next appointment, which is pretty much standard of care. And um, she just wouldn't show up um, and then would show up later, um, usually after hours or weekend, hey, I'm out of my meds. Um, or, you know, uh, I couldn't come today, but squeeze me in tomorrow. And so we did uh, quite a bit of accommodating. Uh, mostly she was saying that she was just um, getting out early to do her um, job hunting. Um, and that was her reason for not being able to make these appointments. Our team was getting more concerned though with us just kind of um, extending um, scripts to her. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, we were uh, trying to accommodate her by saying, you know what, if, when are you going out on your job hunt? Um, you know, um, do you have a uh, interview, et cetera? She was never get, able to give us clear details on that. Um, and uh, we made her uh, several times the first person of the day. Usually we see folks that are on our, our um, medically managed withdrawal unit first. Um, because they're usually more unstable than our, our robot, our mood patients. Um, and then we uh, see uh, those folks uh, for follow-up. Um, but we said, you know, we'll, we'll put you at the beginning so you have all day to get out there um, and still kind of misses. Um, and so, uh, and, and different days of the week, right? So Fridays don't work well, let's try Tuesday. It didn't really, nothing seemed to hit. Um, and so finally we decided, you know what, you know, we said, you really need to make this appointment. We can't keep extending you. Um, and she didn't show and it was on a Friday. And so as the provider, what do I do? <laughs> uh, do I write a little bit more? Um, do I not? Um, and so uh, what I did do is arrange uh, with our, our nurse that, um, she could come on the um, uh, medically managed withdrawal unit uh, to get uh, one film a day through the weekend if she really started having symptoms, but otherwise I would follow up with her on Tuesday. Uh, and so she ended up coming in on, um, on Sunday evening and Monday uh, for a single dose and then we talked Tuesday. Um, and so sitting down with her <laughs> to finally figure out what was going on as uh, she really uh, 
first of all, she was, uh, had not had a slip, had not had, um, you know, any type of use since our last visit for her report. And, um, you know, her urine drug screen um, was non-reactive. Um, she, um, you know, said she was feeling okay. Um, she had been experiencing a little withdrawal over the weekend because she hadn't had full dose. Um, and she was just feeling at a point where, yes, yeah, she knew she had to take this medication, um, but um, it was just annoying that she has to come in, that this is another thing she has to take, a kind of a med adherence thing that I hear her, used to hear all the time when I did a lot of primary care with folks that have diabetes and they just get sick of their insulin um, and having to check things or having to do extra things for a particular medication. And that's kind of the space she was in. Um, our other concern was that as she was um, getting ready um, to transition, perhaps out of HUD housing even, we knew we would be connecting her with a community treatment provider and virtually none of our community treatment provider partners, places that we refer to can really accommodate someone just dropping in um, at this point for their, um, maybe could's not the wrong word, but do not accommodate, you know, if you miss an appointment, well, you can just drop in the next day. Um, you know, we're looking um, to, to get folks into FQHCs, uh, clinics that, you know, um, have regular schedules. And so trying to balance um, wanting to meet this person where they're at, acknowledge where they're at, support their recovery, which um, she was doing well in, and yet um, also prepare her for, you know, what's coming next, right? Um, and not wanting to set her up as well for not doing well um, in her next level of care. So that's what I have. Uh, she was a bit uh, also uh, reluctant initially um, to take the naloxone and to have it, um, but we talked about, you know, her being with her uh, infant um, who'd be crawling around in another couple months and things like that, and she she uh, was agreeable after. Um, that's more something I've seen in in um, uh, for my patients that have been in long term uh, recovery uh, and feel like, you know, uh, um, what are you trying to say? <laughs> um, what do you, um, I don't want this in my house, um, et cetera. So that's all I have. And I will open it up. Thank you so much, Alicia. I guess I'll open the floor up for some discussion now. Um. Um, Alicia, I'm interested to, to ask a few questions. I did want to address the first uh, question or concern that you had around the treatment contracts. Um, that's something that, you know, that's a practice that I'm familiar with. Um, and I've been working in these settings for over 10 years now in opioid treatment programs and things like that. And, um, you know, the treatment contract is generally seen as a way um, to try and get some type of agreement from the person in treatment that they're going to exhibit a different type of behavior. And in many cases, the, um, the alternative is being discharged from treatment. Um, it's important to note that there is nowhere in the regulations does it state that a person needs to, um, you know, basically remain abstinent in order to remain on medications, um, on medications for opioid use. Um, you know, that's generally a policy that organizations are putting in place um, to try and measure success or based on their own definition of success. Um, and so I, an important harm reduction informed question to ask about this um, contract, this treatment contract is, um, are the goals that are being agreed to the, the patient's goals or are they uh, the organization's goals? And, um, and that can be a tough question to ask. Um, but that is a, a very important one when it comes to harm reduction. Um, you know, is the contract that we're entering into based on the patient's goals or is it based on the provider's goals? Um, and, and so maybe that's a question to ask about that. I did want to find out um, a little bit about um, the, the missing follow-up appointments. Is this a patient whose dose is stable or is she trying to get to a stable dose? How's it going with all of that? You know, her dose has been, she'd been on a stable dose for a long time, not reporting any cravings, uh, withdrawal, um, 
you know, feeling comfortable on dose. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, with, with, with missing follow-up appointments, um, one, one thing that, um, that I just discovered from my own experience and then from looking at different ways that providers behave with medications, um, which is that there's, a, there's an assumption that if the patient doesn't come in to get every dose or if their, their attendance is not consistent enough that they're not benefiting from treatment. And in a harm reduction framing, every day that a person takes one of these medications is a day that they're not going to be exposing themselves to the illicit um, drug supply. And for that day, that is a reduction in their risk of dying. Um, and so even if the person is not coming in every day or if they're not adhering to their medication protocol exactly, um, every single day that they do take that medication is a day that they're gonna be much safer. Um, so that's one way to frame harm reduction in terms of this. Now, I will say it's, it's really difficult to actually practice harm reduction when it comes to um, the prescribing of buprenorphine and methadone because many of the regulations that exist were not formulated in concurrence with harm reduction practices or they're not informed by harm reduction practices. So I really commend you for wanting to try and incorporate those two systems because I feel like they can really be effective if they're used um, together. Thank you for working with this patient. And I'd be interested to hear some of the thoughts that come to mind for other folks here. Thanks. Yeah, I would say that treatment contracts, in my experience, by and large, reflect what organizations want uh, more than a, you know, if, if they didn't, if they were patient centered, they would vary by patient, right? Or client. And we tend to use a stock, you know, in, in um, my other hat in um, the, the, um, uh, county uh, safety net system, we have to get everything that's, you know, forms up through uh, umpteen committees before we can even use it and put it in the EHR. So it has to be standardized and, um, you know, that it's standard language. So if it was about a, a patient's goals uh, and incorporated that, it, it wouldn't be standardized. Um, and so most of these systems, you know, at least that I've worked in, it, it's pretty much what what is this organization? And I guess there is some value of to be upfront with um, with patients about you know what this treatment system can offer you um, and what their boundaries are. So I you know uh, I tend to approach it that way when I'm I'm discussing it with patients. Um, but yeah, I I don't kid myself that this is very patient centered. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to commend you on the on the recognizing. Uh, that coming into an appointment intoxicated, oftentimes our participants, that they will not get out of bed or leave the house without being intoxicated, right? It, it might be a necessity uh, to use uh, illicit substance um, to be able to show up for the appointment. For, so seriously, kudos for, for that. I wanted to talk very quickly about uh, the naloxone piece. Um, you know, we have a lot of people that deny naloxone when we try to give it to them at outreach, and there's a variety of reasons. One person was like, he didn't want to go across the border into Canada with it. Uh, another person was because he might get red flagged. Another person didn't want it in his history. Another person uh, just didn't care about people who use drugs. So the way we do it, and this actually came from Donald Trump's Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, who I mentioned, uh, I'll usually just say, you're more likely to run into someone having an opiate overdose than a heart attack today. Right. So it's not about you and it doesn't signify that you're going to relapse and it shouldn't be a stigmatizing flag for any of your family to use against you. Uh, it is it is for you to be able to go out and give back to the community. And I'll end with that. Like oftentimes people who use drugs, like everybody else, we have philanthropic leanings because of criminalization and stigma and felonies. We're not allowed to express that. We're not allowed to engage uh, in giving back to our communities. And this is a really beautiful way, I think, to allow people to meet that human need of uh, giving back to their community. And so framing it, I think that way, that it's not about you, it's about a random person at the bus stop that you might run into. And it's been pretty effective. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. Um, there's so uh, in the interest of time, we'll just take one final question there. I, I see it um, on the chat. Is the patient's med state funded? Does the state have any regulation for non-abstinence to pay in order to pay for meds? Um, so uh, this person is getting it through Be Well. So I think y'all can handle, you guys could answer better than me. Uh, 
what state funding allows us to continue to uh, to write for if uh, someone's not completely asked. Anyone from Be Well? I wish someone comment? from our clinic is here. I'm not sure if anyone is on, but I'm not aware of any regulations that would, you know, make us stop paying for a medication if someone isn't isn't abstinent. That's been but my. If anyone experience. from clinic is on, please feel free to chime in. Either that, or we can always bring that answer back to the next session. Thank you so much, um, Aaron. Could you just quickly summarize some of uh, uh, what we just discussed right now? Absolutely. And um, I just want to thank everybody for your time today and for your willingness to listen and learn together with us. Uh, this is an evolving topic and we're going to continue to learn and work together. Um, and thank you so much today for the, uh, the didactic from Chris Abert and from the, uh, for the case presentation um, from Alicia Kowalczyk. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, and kudos to you, uh, I wanted to say, for gathering this much honest information from the person that you're working with. Um, doing that requires a harm reduction framing and building trust. And some of the recommendations that came from that um, were to work in a collaborative fashion with them around the, any treatment contracts that you might need to develop. Um, you know, that, that uh, their funding is not necessarily contingent upon them being abstinent. Um, and we talked about how Every day being on a medication that is prescribed and the dosage and quality of which is known as a safer day for that person, um, even if the person doesn't show up every single day for treatment. Um, you know, we, we gave a major kudos for working with people who maybe show up intoxicated um, and not denying people treatment for exhibiting uh, conditions of the symptom that they're seeking treatment for. Um, and then finally, I wanted to um, connect you with some services locally there on the form at the end, you mentioned that you're interested in connecting with the local harm reduction provider. Um, so I can, I will send you a, my email address in the chat, or if you want to connect on that, I can definitely hook you up with some folks who provide harm reduction services in your area, uh, so that we can make sure that this person has access to that as well. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you all for joining today's ECHO session. As a reminder to earn CME credits, please complete a post-session survey using the link in the chat. If you would like to present a case, please email Andrea Hebler at hebler at edu. We look forward to seeing you at our next session on Thursday, June 2nd. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. Bye, everybody. You have a great day. Thanks for being Thanks here. Thanks, everyone, for being here.